Good morning. I'm Ramanan Krishnamurti. I'm the Chief Energy Officer at the University of Houston. Welcome to today's uh, symposium on the low carbon electricity grid. Um, a part of our critical issues in energy symposium series. This is our eighth year of the symposium series. And in the virtual world, we've taken a different approach to our symposium. Our, our task over the last uh, several months has been to examine uh, the possibility of uh, creating Houston as the low carbon uh, energy capital of the world and imagining what it would take to get to be the low carbon energy capital of the world. We've identified four pathways to do that and we're bringing to, together symposia on that topic uh, during the fall. Our symposia uh, started last week with a look at carbon capture utilization and storage. Today, it looks at the electric grid as we go, as we think about how um, the the electric grid has to alter itself and how it can help the decarbonization of the energy world as we move forward. Next week, our conversation will focus on hydrogen, and the following week, on the thirtieth, will focus on the circular plastics economy. If you want to know more about the series of uh, studies, uh, please visit our website at. Uh, uh.edu slash energy, energy. And there you will find a report uh, uh, on uh, how uh, Houston becomes the low carbon energy capital of the world. This work uh, uh, was done in collaboration with our colleagues at, this, uh, at the Center for Houston's Future. They have uh, helped us define and, and grow this, uh, this effort, uh, but also uh, uh, our colleagues in the Bauer College of Business and specifically the Gutierrez Energy Management Institute. Uh, Greg Bean from there has been pivotal in making this work happen. Uh, and he, along with many of the students from the Bauer College of Business have really helped us uh, drive the, the, this project to completion. I wanna especially thank Jeannie Kieber of uh, University of Houston's Media Relations for her help in, in putting together a lot of this material in a form that is understandable to uh, the world. I wanna thank uh, Texas Industrial Energy Efficiency Program uh, for helping share uh, this, uh, the, the distribution of, um, of the collateral to, to really bring you to the, uh, to the symposium. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Greg Bean, who is going to walk you through, along with the four students, uh, the effort that uh, his team put together to reimagine what the electric grid should look like by 2050 so that Houston can lead the energy transition. With that, Greg. Thank you, Ramanan. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce the student team that did the research that's at the center of this symposium today. Um, sustainable energy and experiential learning opportunities for students are key pillars of our energy program at Bauer. And I think this effort uh, and this, the students work is a, one of our best examples of that. Uh, our student team that conducted this work is composed of four students from the Bauer College of Business um, and they are Hamza Ansari, who's an undergraduate student in accounting and finance in Bauer. Cameron Barrett, who is a master's of science uh, in finance student. Turner Harris, who's an MBA student in Bauer. And Nishala Naini, who is an undergraduate student in accounting and management. And so I will now turn it over to Turner Harris, who will kick off. Thanks, Greg. And I will uh, just let you know that we appreciate you guys signing on. And uh, we heard there's quite a few of you. Uh, so thanks for giving us this opportunity uh, to present uh, the study to you all. We had a lot of fun uh, working through it and we're just definitely looking forward to presenting the results to you. Um, I know we don't have all morning, but before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our industry partner, Apex Ks, uh, who really did the heavy lifting and were invaluable to the success of the work we're about to present to you. So Sarah, Jack and Steve, just thanks so much uh, for all that you did. So to get started, uh, I'd like to just kind of cover our, our key findings. Uh, these will set the tone for the rest of the information that you'll see uh, in the over the course of the presentation. Uh, so 
The first key finding is that ERCOT, which is essentially the power grid uh, that serves Texas, is already achieving annual reductions uh, in, carbon, in carbon intensity. And the trends we see in renewable growth suggest that this will actually continue to be true uh, moving forward. Uh, but this study isn't about, you know, achieving annual reductions in carbon intensity, right? It's about achieving net zero by 2050. Uh, so that brings us to our, our second key finding, uh, which is that uh, if you are trying to reduce carbon intensity by way of increasingly higher renewable penetrations, you're always going to encounter three main challenges. And those challenges are uh, the mismatch between renewable production and energy load profiles. Uh, the second challenge is the seasonal and diurnal variability of renewable production. And the third challenge is the just substantial existence, or sorry, the existence of substantial uh, must run generation on ERCOT. And so outside of those three challenges, we come to our third key finding, which is that you will not achieve net zero really in any scenario without appropriate storage solutions. Uh, but rest assured in this presentation, we will discuss exactly what appropriate storage looks like. And our final key finding is that uh, while achieving net zero emissions from the grid is technically feasible, uh, there, there, there's a diminishing return, right? Where the cost of eliminating the final few percentages uh, of carbon emissions from the grid, it's gonna far exceed the cost to simply reduce carbon uh, from other sectors of the economy. So those are essentially the key findings of the report and I'll move on here. Yep, so we thought it was appropriate to quickly acknowledge that Texas happens to be very well positioned uh, for an expansion of renewable energy and energy and energy storage. We've got world-class wind and solar resources. Uh, we have one of the largest unregulated energy markets in the world. Uh, we've got extensive midstream and transmission infrastructure. We have excellent salt geology, uh, which allows for a huge uh, storage potential. And for Houston specifically, uh, we have an extensive base of decision makers for energy focused capital. Uh, we've got a concentration of both renewable energy developers, as well as global energy producers uh, here in Houston who are beginning to shift their business models really to address climate related uh, risks. We also have a highly skilled and diverse energy workforce. And finally, uh, we have a world-class brown hydrogen infrastructure already in place. And all of these points, what, what they simply mean is that Houston itself actually has an opportunity to uh, cement its leadership role in the low or zero carbon future. Yep. So to get to where we want to be, I think it's prudent to step back and, and look at how we got to where we are now, All right. So this first graph shows the renewable penetration of ERCOT compared to its CO2 intensity uh, from 2011 to 2019. And we've actually been fortunate that our renewable additions have made coal economics particularly unattractive. Uh, so there were some, sub some substantial coal retirements, which play a major factor in that uh, downward trajectory of the purple line, which is the average CO2 intensity of ERCOT. The second graph shows the wind and solar additions from 2015 to 2020. And 2020 is expected to close with nearly eight gigawatts uh, of new additions. And this is important because to achieve the estimated 200 to 250 gigawatts of renewable capacity needed in 2050, you're gonna need somewhere between five and a half and seven gigawatts of renewable capacity additions every single year. Uh, so what that means is the 2020 numbers are actually in line uh, with this amount. Uh, but with that said, you know, adding this amount of renewables to the grid every year, it, it creates its own challenges. So I'll pass to Nishala to discuss that in a bit more detail. Thanks. Thank you, Turner. So as you can see, the chart before us shows us the impact of what is to, to occur if we were to add the, the 2020 rate of 7.9 gigawatts of renewable capacity additions every year from now until 2050 without the adequate storage in place. The green line here represents wind capacity, whereas the yellow line represents our growing solar capacity. Cumulatively, the additions grow to about 270 gigawatts of renewables by 2050. It is important to note that as renewable capacity grows without the adequate storage in place, we can see the supply share penetration begin to plateau reflected by the green shade here, as well as see the total curtailment significantly increase represented by the purple shade. Now, I will be moving into our key three challenges presented on our pathway to net zero grid. So our first challenge is that renewables are intermittent. They vary across all hours of the day, seasonally and annually, which creates an uncertainty in supply. 
Challenge number two is that renewable production patterns do not align with ERCOT load. This then creates an imbalance of over and under supply over periods of time. For example, summer air conditioning loads tend to peak when wind production is the lowest. And lastly, our third challenge involves our must run generation or price taking units, which displaces our renewable production during low demand hours. Must run capacity includes nuclear, cogeneration, and units which provide grid reliability services. These price taking units offer energy at very low or negative prices, displacing wind and solar during hours of high renewable output and low demand. We can note that our main challenge involves this must run cogen as nuclear is already carbon free and coal is soon to be retired. Next, I will be passing it to Hamza, who's going to describe the study and methodology we utilized to help us understand the implications of and the potential solutions for these three key challenges presented. Thanks, Michelle. So when discussing the methodology we used to produce and evaluate different scenarios to a net zero grid, there's a lot to talk about, as you can probably tell from the slide. But I think the most important thing to note is that none of the numbers you'll see in the coming slides or projections or forecasts, they're simply scenarios. Uh, scenarios to help us understand what high renewable penetration looks like, what the implications of that high penetration are, and how we can mitigate the negative characteristics of that high penetration. Uh, but of course, if we're gonna develop scenarios, we need to start with the base case, uh, which we will discuss in the next slide. So if you take a look at the leftmost graph, uh, you, you can see the different uh, nameplate capacities for different high penetration mixes uh, that we can have. And those name cap capacities were calculated by taking the 2050 ERCOT forecasted load, less nuclear, and taking the average capacity factors of solar and wind uh, to develop those nameplate capacities. Now you can see that the heavy wind scenario was selected. And that's because it had the highest amount of curtailment, sorry, the lowest amount of curtailment and the highest amount of penetration in the grid. And that's the general rule we apply when evaluating different scenarios. We wanna see the highest amount of penetration uh, with the lowest amount of curtailment. Now, inherent to all of these scenarios and especially the base case we selected, which is the heavy wind scenario is production variability. Uh, and that's what we'll take a look at in the next slide. I wanna direct your attention to the graphs here. So the left graph uh, describes or shows uh, capacity factor variation over the course of a day. Uh, and the right graph shows how capacity factors change uh, over the course of a month. Now, the essential rule here is that because of these uh, capacity factor or production variability, um, there is imbalances in the grid. There's both oversupply and undersupply when production doesn't match load. Uh, and that's a problem. But in order to address it, we have to understand how these imbalances both manifest and what the magnitude uh, of these imbalances actually are. And we can take a look at that uh, in the next slide. Now, if you take a look at the rightmost uh, or the leftmost graph here, you can see the daily imbalances that occur uh, because of production uh, variability. Now, these imbalances are pretty random. Uh, they're due to nature, really. There's no rhyme or reason to them. But if you aggregate that randomness over time, uh, you get seasonal imbalances. And there's a definite pattern there. There's high oversupply in the spring season when production capacities are high. Uh, and there's undersupply in the summer season when they are low. Uh, but of course, how much imbalance do we actually have? What is the size of the imbalance? Well, if we look at the rightmost graph, we can see that the area underneath the curve describes that. If you look at the area underneath the curve, 90% of imbalances can be addressed by 50,000 megawatts of storage. Uh, put another way, 50,000 megawatts of storage are enough uh, to address about 90% of storage events or imbalances. But not all imbalances are equal. They manifest in different ways. And so we need different technologies to address them. Uh, and my colleague, Nishala, will talk about them uh, in the next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Hamza. The table before us covers the various storage technologies we utilized in generating our scenarios. First is our lithium ion battery technology, which provides us with four hours of storage duration. Second, our K's or compressed air energy storage solution, which provides us with 48 hours of storage duration. And most essentially, our power to hydrogen storage technology, which utilizes the electrolysis process to convert excess renewable production into green hydrogen. Electrolysis is essentially the process of separating water 
into hydrogen and oxygen, which we will then later store and utilize to fuel dispatchable capacity. In building our scenarios, it was important for us to identify the right amount of storage capacity for existing battery and case technology, which will lead us into our next slide. So the chart before us shows us what happens to renewable penetration as we add storage technology, given the 2050 base case renewable capacity. Renewable supply share is represented on the Y axis and storage capacity is represented here on the X axis. We can see as, as we add more batteries and cage storage capacity, that the benefits measured as renewable supply share begin to diminish beyond the point of about 30 gigawatts of storage capacity. And this is how we chose to use, utilize the 30 gigawatt point of lithium ion batteries and case technology in the respective scenarios, which, will, I, which I will talk about in our next slide. Now, I will be moving into presenting our six individual scenarios that represent potential pathways towards a low carbon grid. The first bar here is our no storage renewables only base case. We can see that it is a heavy wind scenario with 121 gigawatts of incremental wind additions that cost near 157 billion and 62 gigawatts of new solar additions costing 62 billion in investment costs. We also require an additional 20 gigawatts of thermal capacity in order to maintain reserves. This scenario starts us at a base of 80.7% carbon free grid. Our second bar here depicts a scenario in which we utilize our four hour battery solution and we maintain the same amount of renewable capacity. However, then we add the 30 gigawatts of lithium ion battery storage. We can see here that we still need about 20 gigawatts of natural gas capacity in order to maintain the minimum reserves at all hours. This costs us about $274 billion in investment capital and gets us to 81.5% carbon free supply. Now our third bar here depicts a scenario in which we utilize our 48 hour K's solution. This is a scenario, this scenario again, maintains the same amount of renewable capacity as our base case, plus the 30 gigawatt addition of 48 hour case storage. We can see here that we don't require the additional thermal capacity in order to maintain our reserves. And because of this, our investment costs are cheaper, costing only about 258 billion in order to achieve a higher carbon free grid close to 87%. Now, I will be moving in to our power to hydrogen scenarios that utilizes the electrolysis process that I had previously mentioned. Our fourth bar here depicts a scenario in which our must run cogeneration units are converted to hydrogen. As you can see, this scenario here requires a greater amount of renewable capacity additions in order to power the 20 gigawatts of electrolysis capacity. This is essential for us in order to create the hydrogen needed to fuel the cogeneration units enabling a more carbon free supply. This will cost about 279 billion in investment costs and bring us to an 89.4% carbon free grid. Moving into our fifth bar, this represents a scenario in which 50% of our cogeneration is retired while the remaining 50% of must run cogen as well as 20 gigawatts of case storage runs on green hydrogen. Again, we will need to add significant amounts of renewable capacity and 25 gigawatts of electrolysis to meet the hydrogen demand in this scenario. This will cost 319 billion in investment capital and bring us to a 95.8% carbon free supply. Now, lastly, our six bar here depicts a scenario in which again, 50% of our cogeneration is retired while the remaining 50% is to run on hydrogen and the natural gas capacity, natural gas fleet is capable of burning up to 100% hydrogen. This scenario requires an even greater amount of renewable capacity additions, as well as 30 gigawatts of electrolysis capacity to meet the hydrogen demand that can bring us to a carbon free grid. Overall, this will require $354 billion in investment capital. Next, I will pass it on to Turner, who will further discuss the trade-off between the required capital investment and carbon-free supply presented in these scenarios. 
Yep, thanks, Nishala. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the, the same six scenarios Nishala just covered, uh, but simplified and expressed a few different ways to essentially highlight what you get for a given level of investment and to, to suss out where that diminishing return is, right? So the graph in the top left is really the most important, and it's the percentage of CO2 free supply uh, on the Y axis and the required capital investment uh, along the X axis. Uh, so the first thing I want to point out is that with no storage, you're actually able to achieve slightly higher than 80% carbon free supply with a $240 billion investment over the next 30 years. And what we find interesting is that uh, for comparatively not much more at 258 billion, you can achieve 87% carbon free supply by adding only 30 gigawatts uh, of long duration compressed air energy storage. So we thought that was good to point out. Uh, you may also have noticed that by adding 30 gigawatts of four hour battery storage costs more than 30 gigs of, of Ks, but doesn't actually translate uh, into a meaningful reduction in carbon. And so what this indicates is that long duration storage is simply more effective uh, at serving load imbalances than battery storage, and you'll get a lot more bang for your buck. Uh, but to get to 90% carbon free supply or better, you have to start using green hydrogen uh, to convert the cogeneration and the natural gas fleets, which are the, the really big CO2 emitters uh, in ERCOT. And you need them to run on a carbon free fuel source, or at least an increasingly high mixture of carbon free fuel. So while in these scenarios, you will see very high levels of uh, carbon reduction to the tune of a 90, 95, and, and effectively 100%. Uh, this is really where you start to see the diminishing return. Um, you know, creating green hydrogen by way of electrolysis, it requires not only more uh, renewable generation to support the electrolysis process, uh, but, you know, you're, so you're paying for more wind and solar there, but you're also having to pay for the electrolysis equipment as well as the necessary storage additions. Uh, so again, for that reason, these three hydrogen scenarios uh, require materially more investment, but they are the only scenarios uh, in this study at least, that achieved greater than a 90% carbon reduction. Uh, the second graph is simply the carbon price uh, per ton required to keep the renewable uh, prices competitive in order to maintain the attractiveness of continued investment uh, in renewables over the time frame of the study. And these carbon taxes also play a big role in the third graph, which is the demand weighted price of energy. It's essentially what consumers pay uh, for energy under the given scenarios. And what we're seeing is that in these scenarios, uh, the energy prices land somewhere between $36 and $42 per megawatt. And we think it's worth noting that in 2018, uh, the actual price consumers paid was just over $35 per megawatt. Uh, so the ultimate price to the consumer in any of these scenarios isn't unrealistic by any means. Yep, so this is our final slide, and it's simply a summary roadmap of how you could theoretically approach uh, building out the net zero scenario and the order in which you, know, you would want to undertake that endeavor. Uh, now, I know everyone wants to get to this awesome panel, uh, so I won't read all this text to you, but what I'd really like to point out uh, are these dark green arrows, which are essentially our external assumptions. These are the things that were true for really all of the scenarios that we, that we uh, developed, not just the net zero scenario. So these assumptions were that uh, there's gonna be a continuation of wind and solar additions, uh, roughly equivalent to what we're seeing in 2020. Uh, we assume that some uh, form of a tax credit would be maintained for wind and solar. We assumed that ERCOT would be building out transmission capacity to be able to handle all of the uh, renewable additions and to avoid congestion. And finally, we assumed that there'd be some amount of growth in ESG investment appetite. And so that's really it for our team. Uh, I, I hope you found this interesting.
Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to moderate today. Um, I want to start by introducing you to our esteemed panel of experts who are going to give you a few opening remarks before uh, we go to your questions, which I've already gotten several of, which is great. Um, so I want to introduce the entire panel first. Uh, I want to start with uh, Mr. Jack Farley, who is the CEO and president of Apex Compressed Air Energy Storage, which develops, builds, operates, and commercializes utility scale compressed air energy storage facilities. Pre previously, he was the senior vice president and regional president of two different entities that are now owned by Duke Energy and NRG, respectively. And he has a bachelor of business administration from the University of Kentucky and an MBA from Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, interesting fact, Toyd, he was, when he was um, in the U.S. Army, he, in 1989, he was stationed in Germany when the wall came down. So if we, um, if we run out of really interesting things to, to ask, I think we could ask about that. That would be fun. Next is Marianne Berlinski, who's the president of EDF Energy North America, which is the world's largest producer of low carbon electricity. She serves on several boards of directors for entities that are dedicated to women and dedicated to sustainable energy. And her latest board appointment is to Real Houston, the Renewable Energy Alliance of Houston, which has a mission to ensure Houston is the energy capital of and for the future. Um, she received her engineering degree from uh, Rensselaer Polytech Institute and the MBA from the University of Houston. Yay. Okay, next is Vijay Baytan Batla. So hopefully I did that okay. Has more than 15 years of energy industry experience in utility, independent system operator, energy financing and consulting. He is associate director for Guidehouse where he consults parties in the areas of disaster recovery, smart grids, renewable and distributed energy. Um, he also worked for ERCOT, so we can definitely ask him some great questions about ERCOT previously. Um, he provided energy ener uh, engineering support and developing situational awareness solutions for the control room there. He has a master's degree in electrical engineering as well as an MBA from the University um, of Texas. Next is Dr. Becca Jones Albertus. Um, who has dedicated her career to advancing solar technology. She's the director of Solar Energy Technologies Office within the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy, where she leads a team that supports early stage solar energy research and systems integration. She received her electrical engineering degree from Princeton and has a master's and PhD in material science and engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. Last, I have the honor of introducing you who introduced me. Um, so Professor Greg Bean, who is, you've already heard from earlier today, um, is a graduate of Texas A&M University. He's an executive director, the executive director of the Guterres Energy Management Institute and the director of Bauer Energy Education. He joined Bauer as head of the energy program about three years ago, after nearly 40 years in the energy industry. Um, sustainable energy is a major focus of the program at Bauer in terms of curriculum and um, industry knowledge advancement and experiential learning opportunities for the students. In fact, he was the faculty mentor for the students who conducted the research pro project that you heard about today. So, Mr. Farley, do you want to kick us off um, today with your, a few opening remarks? Sure. Okay, uh, happy Friday, everyone. And uh, I'd like to start by saying how much I appreciated working with uh, Greg and Turner and Nishala and Hamza and Cameron. It was a lot of fun and I'm kind of sad it's over. Um, I'll just say about decarbonization of the Texas grid. I, I started my career in power in the 90s when the energy transition was to deregulated retail markets and competition at the wholesale level. And this transition uh, was kind of centered around 
you know, reducing costs and in, in improving choice and kind of pushed by more of an insider, uh, insiders to the industry and policy folks who were kind of building on the success of deregulation in airlines and telecom and transportation. You know, now moving for the last 10 years, I've been focused on energy storage and how high renewable penetration affects renewable patterns, um, how uh, decarbonization can actually succeed and what, you know, solutions are required. And I'll say about this transition, maybe call it transition 2.0 to a decarbonized grid, it feels much, much more solid in terms of the consumer support, voter support. Uh, the everyday guy who uses electricity in Texas probably didn't pay a lot of attention to retail deregulation in the 90s. Uh, but the everyday guy cares about climate change. They care about trying to, you know, avoid damage to the planet. And, uh, you know, decarbonization is really fundamentally fueled by that, that caring by so many people out there. So I, I think decarbonization will be a, a much bigger transition with a lot more support and go a lot further than the initial deregulation phase of the industry. So I'm, I'm excited about where this is going to go. I think it's going to go a long way. Mary, do you want to go next? Marianne? Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Marianne Berlinski. As Gina mentioned, I work for EDF, Electricity de France, uh, here in Houston. Um, a little bit about my background. I actually um, have an engineering degree uh, right out of university. I started at Exxon. I made hydrocarbons for a living. Um, and I got my MBA at night while I was working full time. And when I graduated um, with the MBA, it was my ticket um, to get into um, what I am now very passionate about in the, in the energy space around electricity and natural gas markets. Uh, my first job at Dynegy, they handed me a power station. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, the markets were quickly deregulating at that time and it was an amazing chance to get in and learn firsthand as, as we went from regulated to deregulated. Um, EDF is a, a, um, one of the largest producers of electricity on the planet. Uh, last year, we made over 558 terawatt hours of electricity. And interestingly enough, 90% of the energy that we generated was carbon free. So from nuclear uh, and renewable um, resources. We have 165,000 employees worldwide. And this topic of um, low carbon grid um, and getting to a, a net zero is a conversation that is happening all over the world. Uh, and this is a great opportunity for Houston um, and our University of Houston students to really take a front seat position as this transition um, happens across the energy markets. And, and I'm very excited to be a powder, part of it uh, and looking forward to participating on this panel. Great, thank you, DJ. You want to go next? Yes, thank you, Gina, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it is such an honor to be with you all today, and I uh, want to thank the students for this excellent work and their presentation this morning. So as uh, we think about the future, right, uh, looking at 2050 timeframe, I think there's, there's a few different things that we need to focus on. I'll, I'll stick with uh, maybe the top three, at least in my mind, um, technology and costs, right? The technology advancements are happening faster than we can, uh, we can keep track. Every day we hear about new compositions of battery uh, storage, uh, better and uh, bigger wind turbines, right? So uh, better, uh, more efficient solar, uh, solar panels and such. EVs are gonna completely revolutionize uh, the, uh, not only just the transportation industry, but um, uh, the electricity industry, because we will be supplying that uh, electricity. And, and the other part to it is costs are coming down even faster. If you look at uh, what's going on with solar and wind in ERCOT market, um, uh, solar is uh, less than $20 per megawatt hour, and wind is even cheaper, and uh, storage and offshore wind are quickly catching up. So uh, the second piece is transmission. 
uh, one of the assumptions that uh, was made for this study, and uh, I agree with the assumption, it's uh, too big to handle in a study like this, but uh, the assumption was that ERCOT will build the transmission, but uh, will it be able to build it fast enough? If you look at what we did in 2012, 2013 timeframe, when we built the CRES transmission, right? We, uh, we built it for 14 giga gigawatts of, uh, uh, solar and wind from West Texas, and we tapped that out pretty quickly. Uh, we are pretty soon going to hit 25 gigawatts of uh, solar and wind in uh, in West Texas. So, how do we move fast enough, and how do we do the make the right investments? Uh, if you look at uh, the solar and wind sightings, right, the, for new projects, nobody's sighting in uh, West Texas anymore. Um, uh, projects are looking for sites in uh, Houston, North and South region. So that's going to be um, an important factor. And the third one uh, that I, I think is probably more important than the first two is how we make this transition from where we are to what we are going to be in 2050, right? It's, um, uh, it's looking at such an uncertain future, but a good, it's a good way, right? Good, it's a good uncertainty. We need to make sure we handle the risks of obsolescence and uh, make sure we don't end up with stranded ass assets uh, and we need to make wise decisions and equitable decisions uh, as we go through this transition. So looking forward to this, uh, uh, the, the discussion for the next hour, but uh, it's such an exciting time to be in this industry to deal with all these uh, different challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jones, Alberta. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to be here with you all today. Um, so yeah, I'm Becca Jones Albertus. I'm the director of the Department of Energy's Solar Energy Technologies Office, as Gina mentioned. And what we do is we have a budget uh, this year, about $280 million, that we support research, development, and demonstration projects um, related to solar energy technology and how it integrates onto the electricity grid. So it's an incredibly uh, exciting time, and uh, I have a lot of fun spending my days learning about our new technologies that we're developing to help support the energy transition. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here today because um, as we're in the middle of uh, a time of tremendous change in the electricity sector and one where um, you know, e even more change is expected over the coming decades, what's really important is that we have uh, today's students thinking about these problems uh, as the students who presented today have uh, been doing so well and are starting to develop uh, the solutions that we're going to need to take us forward. Um, we, we really uh, need to continue to see more and more students getting engaged in these issues and supplying a workforce of the future uh, as all of this is changing so rapidly. When I started um, getting excited about solar technology about 20 years ago, solar was um, like, it, essentially not deployed on the electricity grid. It was, you know, less than like a thousandth of our electricity supply. And when I told people I was excited about solar energy, I had to explain what that meant. No one, no one really knew what a solar panel was. You know, today solar panels are in my kids, um, you know, their, their, their children's books uh, on houses. Um, and so I, I feel like I've already seen just incredibly rapid change with the growth of natural gas, solar and wind in the past decade. Um, is already, again, been transforming our electricity sector, but there's so much more to go as, uh, as we um, aim for some of these low carbon goals of the future. So it's an incredibly exciting time. It's a great time to be engaged in these topics. Um, we need a lot of great minds and, you know, we need every, all, all kinds of new skills like uh, data analytics to deal with um, all of the tremendous amounts of data uh, one thing we haven't talked about as much today, but um, in terms of some of the changes in the electricity sector, we're also seeing um, a lot of solar and energy storage being deployed on rooftops or other places in the distribution system in very small generators. And so that offers a lot of new opportunities for how we um, operate the distribution system and how it can support um, resilience. Uh, but it also offers a lot of challenges around how you uh, use that data and how you use those systems to support the reliability of the grid. Um, so I think one thing I'll just offer as we go into the um, discussion and questions, I think as we think about the electricity mix and the needs of the grid, uh, for me, um, 
the things that are you know really most important to think about are how we support the affordability and the reliability of the grid. And so some of the things like you know if we have oversupply or we're throwing away solar or wind power, you know if, if electricity is still affordable and the grid is still reliable, some of those things uh, actually may not matter, which can be counterintuitive. Um, so I will uh, I'll put put that forward there about affordability and, and reliability, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And um, and last but definitely not least, Professor B, you want to make some comments? Yes, thank you, uh, Gina. Um, as I think about you know the broader energy transition, I'm struck by how important a low zero carbon energy grid will be to achieving those goals. Um, the, you know, the United Nations has set out the uh, sustainable development goals, and there are five of those that are directly relevant to energy, access, energy security, and three in particular that uh, we're often focused on with respect to decarbonization or increasing in renewables, which is uh, reducing the impact of climate change, air pollution, and other ancillary effects associated with our use globally of energy. And while we've talked a lot about, uh, and we're fo very focused on Texas, um, which I think is appropriate, but the impact of this globally is going to be huge. Um, the IEA estimates that um, electricity will, will share of final energy consumption will grow by 50% over the just the next 20 years. It will penetrate all sectors, not just the traditional building sector, but a lot of industrial uses will be electrified. And of course, we're all familiar with the uh, rapid electrification that's coming in the transportation sector. So this is really a global issue. And I think it's very important. And Houston is very well positioned to lead in this, in this effort. We are the largest consuming energy state we consume 70 more percent more energy than California, which is the second largest consuming state. We have a very large energy intensive industrial base. Um, we are the largest producer of electricity. We produce 90 percent more electricity than the next largest uh, state, which is Florida. So we have also a lot of the skills and knowledge that we have developed in other sectors of the energy industry, which are directly applicable to making this transition. And so I'm very confident that, you know, Houston can be a leader um, in uh, all four of the elements of the energy transition that we've, we're talking about in this project, but in particular around decarbonizing the energy grid. Excellent, well, thank you. Um, Okay, so I have several questions for the panel. One thing I wanted to mention, uh, I've had a lot of questions about the slides and, and um, so I just definitely wanna let you know that the student slides are available in our ask a question page um, on the UH EDU energy ask. So you should be able to get those um, pretty easily through that. Okay. So let's just start with this. Um, Jack, you mentioned that there's a need for decarbonization and that's really what's on everyone's mind at the moment. And so I have, I have a question for you about what policy actions do you think are needed for this decarbonization trend? And particularly for Houston, but um, any thoughts that you have to start us off with that? Oh, thanks Gina. Um, I think top of the list is some sort of carbon price or carbon tax. Um, I, you know, I, I started my career right when SO2 and NOx cap and trade was kind of in full swing. And, you know, that was essentially placing an implied value on the emissions to account for the externalities. And it worked. I mean, emissions have gone down tremendously in SOx and NOx in the U.S. in the last three decades. So I think that's got to be top of the list. Um, you know, moving way down below that, I would say, you know, continuance of the uh, investment tax credit, production tax credit for wind and solar, and expansion of the investment tax credit or production tax credit 
to uh, standalone storage, whether that's hydrogen or K's, what I do, but are batteries that are not co-located, you know, with wind and solar. I think that would make, you know, a fairly big difference going forward. But again, the, the top of the list is a carbon price or tax in the, across the nation. Marianne, do you want to add to that? Sure. sure. Um, I think one of the other um, interesting things that we need to really look at in our markets and Texas, um, and unlike your children, you can have a favorite market. It's totally okay to have one. Um, ERCOT is my favorite. I've, I've kind of grown up uh, in the ERCOT market as it's gone from regulated to deregulated, zonal to nodal. Um, one of the fundamental principles of our market in Texas, there's no um, capacity payments for units. So you are competing on um, dispatching your units or hedging them appropriately. But our pricing mechanisms are all built on the marginal unit. So if I have to ramp up one megawatt, what is that cost um, to turn on that extra, extra megawatt? And then all of the assets in real time get paid that, that clearing price, essentially. Um, that works really well when you have thermal units and gas-fired units that are burning more gas and there's a, there's a fairly transparent gas market and you know the heat rates of, of the units that are being dispatched. Um, it becomes much more difficult when you have renewable resources that have zero marginal cost. Um, and, and so I do think that as we have large percentages of our generation coming off of units that have a, a zero dispatch cost, incremental cost, um, we do have to look at how we'll set prices uh, for the markets going forward. So whether that's a, a demand component, so what, is, what are loads willing to pay, um, or some other renewable, um, you know, adder. Uh, but but I do think that as we go from a, a, a market that has a lot of natural gas generation being dispatched to one with, you know, mostly renewables, um, even was looking at, at some data studying for this panel. And in May, we had an hour in Texas where just shy of 60% of the energy was coming from wind. And so when you've, when you've got that much penetration of, of renewable energy, how do you set a clearing price that economic decisions can be made on going forward? So I do think we wanna look at fundamentally how have we set pricing mechanisms um, to dispatch assets. And VJ, I wanted to ask you, so along the same line, what about industrial decarbonization? Any thoughts on that? That's a big hot topic. Yes. Um, electrification in general is going to be a big factor going forward, right? And um, if you look at industrial energy consumption, it's I think about 15% of the total energy consumption across the US and much of it, the, some of it is already electrified, but much of it is still uh, from uh, conventional sources. So as that load is switched onto the grid, how do we uh, position ourselves to both serve it, but also serve it in a clean and economical manner, right? That's where there's huge opportunities. Again, similar to the electrification as well, uh, of uh, transportation as well, right? Uh, transportation consumes 30% energy um, of the overall energy consumption in the U.S. That's a huge load, even bigger, right? And a bigger opportunity as well. So I, I think both those, right? We can put the, uh, put both of those in the big electrification bucket. And it's something that uh, the electric industry should look at as an opportunity to both as new load to serve, <laughs> make more dollars, but also to serve it in a cleaner manner. And Dr. Becca Jones, do you want to add to that? And then maybe talk about a, a little bit about, um, uh, I had one question just to kind of like glom onto that, an interesting angle for the rapid deployment of solar through solar thermal. And do you see that much penetration of solar thermal for industrial heating? So as a way of decarbonizing the system, right? Yeah, so I think, a uh, general comment is whereas how you decarbonize the electricity sector, the transportation sector, I think we have um, like pretty, there's pretty clear visions and pathways for how one would do that. And uh, obviously we've the students talk through 
Um, electrification earlier in the industrial sector is, is not, there's not a clear pathway. There's a number of options. Um, and, uh, you know, those, those include switching fuels to a green produced fuel. They include electrification. And then they include technologies like um, solar thermal. So uh, my office supports concentrating solar thermal technology development, which um, may not be familiar to all of you, but basically uses mirrors. You could also use lenses to concentrate sunlight and generate a whole bunch of heat. And then that heat can be used for the industrial processes that are currently burning fuels to produce heat uh, to drive their needs. So there are a handful of um, plants across the country today that are using concentrating solar thermal technology to um, for their heat needs. Um, there's some drying of uh, uh, nuts in California and cheese and, and things like that that have some of these pilot plants. And this is definitely an opportunity for the industrial sector. Right now, the costs are significantly higher. And um, one of the challenges is just the, the great diversity of the industrial sector. It's not about, we can't just develop this solar thermal technology that you know looks like this one thing, and then we're going to plug that in, and that's going to work for everybody's needs because they're so diverse. So we are um, working on solutions to bring down those costs uh, to help meet a greater fraction of those needs. Um, and it is promising for the future, but today it is significantly more expensive in most in most situations. Gina, I have a follow-up question to Dr. Okay. Becca. Or go ahead, who was that? Becca's fine. Sure. <laughs> VJ. So um, th I'm not an expert on solar thermal, but looking at solar PV and the cost declines and the scalability and the uh, obvious advantages with the, that technology, right? Would those in, uh, to some extent apply to solar thermal as well? Can we scale that technology? Can the prices come down as uh, meteorically like uh, it has come down for PV? Uh, so, so yes and no. So one of the things that's really special about photovoltaics is that whatever size you make them, the fundamental unit is a semiconductor. So if you make it tiny, teeny, teeny, or you make a huge, huge panel, you don't change the efficiency of that power production significantly. This is um, unlike most generators that, that use turbines that have to be like a certain size and scope to really be efficient and be cost effective. So solar PV was, uh, and batteries, uh, electrochemical batteries are, you know, are similar. Um, in, in the sense that uh, their scalability was easier because they could start out with small installations. And when those proved that they worked, you could do a whole bunch of little, little things. It didn't take a ton of capital. Um, and then when those proved they worked, you could go bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, and so the scaling was accelerated because um, you didn't have to wait a long time to raise a whole bunch of money. You could start small and then build. And I think that it, that's one of the things that's enabled really rapid um, scaling and cost decline in photovoltaics. Concentrating solar thermal uses a um, turbine generator. So you need to be at the hundreds of megawatt scale, 100 or greater megawatt scale um, for a single plant to be efficient. And so it's harder to get that first and second plant in the ground. Now for some of these industrial uses that aren't electricity based, you don't have to reach that same scale. Um, but uh, but you do um, need to, to get to economies of scale, you do need to kind of consolidate on one kind of form factor so that you can scale that up and bring costs down. So there's tremendous potential to bring the cost down just through deployment and reaching economies of scale for, for solar thermal, um, but either because of the, the larger size or the fact that we haven't consolidated on a single technology form factor, we're not really marching down that right now. Um, but there's tremendous opportunity for those costs to come down if we uh, unlock deployment there. Uh, Professor Bean, do you want to have any last comments on these policies for decarbonization? Um, no, I don't have anything specifically on the policies. Just with respect to industrial demand, I think what happens in terms of decarbonizing industrial demand is going to be very critical for us in terms of how that takes place. Um, if you think, look at the heavy or so-called hard to abate industries, um, they are you know, steel, petrochemicals, chemicals, and cement. Um, we have you know, such a large industrial base here 
And yet those are very hard to decarbonize uh, because of many, in many cases of the very high uh, temperature, high heat requirements in those industries. And as a result, electricity will probably find itself uh, potentially competing with hydrogen, which of course could be generated from the electricity um, in terms of, of how demand grows in that sector for electricity. And I think that's gonna be something that's gonna be very interesting for us to watch. Um, uh, there's clearly some uncertain, there's less uncertainty in the building sector about how that gets electrified and that's fairly straightforward. Um, it's a little bit less uncertain, the pace of electrification and light duty vehicles. But when you start talking about the hard to abate sectors, which are those industrial sectors, plus thinking about heavy duty trucking, long haul trucking, things like that, the interplay between electricity and, and hydrogen will be very interesting and have a big impact on the demand side, which we haven't really talked a lot about. All right. Um, so I, I love this question um, and I don't know, I think that I'll just see who wants to tackle this. Um, um, maybe, maybe actually Marianne, you could start us off with this. So I have a question here. It says, why Houston, right? I haven't seen, they say, a robust case for staking claim of clean energy capital of the world. Only pep talks. Um, why, are, why is Houston in a better position than some other cities? Um, so it's kind of a fun question. Let's hear what you have to say on that. Um, well, sure. I think there, there's, a, there's actually probably a multitude of answers to this question. But my personal view um, is that Houston being the energy capital of the world. And when I first uh, graduated with my engineering degree and decided that, you know, I was going to um, go work for Exxon, I was told, you know, all roads go through Houston. If you're going to be in the energy industry at some point, you are going to find yourself employed in Houston. When you look at what the average American thinks about energy or Houston, they typically do think big oil, um, energy equivalent crude, um, now, you know, uh, gasoline for your car, like it takes a bit to get people to think, okay, well, my electricity is also a really large component of the energy markets in the US. So we already have headquarters for some of the largest energy companies in the world. Um, I think we've got from a um, getting people to come work in Houston. I grew up in upstate New York. Um, Houston's a very friendly place to come work. Um, the, the job market is fantastic. There's a low cost of living. There's no state income tax. Um, so when you start saying, okay, well, what's, what's Houston got going for it? You know, a lot. Um, as far as the transition to um, being the, the, the green uh, energy capital of the world, um, we do have a bit of a marketing problem because when people think, and they think of us as oil, not necessarily wind and solar, they think uh, California or maybe even Austin. So really trying to educate uh, students that there are great jobs in energy um, green energy, low carbon energy here in Houston. Uh, one of the, um, you, you mentioned in my intro, I'm, I'm on the board of REAL, uh, the Renewable Energy Alliance Houston. Again, its, it's goal is to help get energy professionals together to create um, educational workshops, and symposiums to help get the word out of what is Houston doing. Uh, and then lastly, I do think coming back to those big oil companies, if you go on to Shell or Exxon or Chevron, um, you are starting to see them talk about what does 2050 look like and, and how are they going to diversify away from hydrocarbons. So um, I do think that we have a tremendous amount of momentum in, in converting Houston to be the, the green energy capital of the world. Um, but we do have some headwinds with, with kind of a perception problem and really trying to educate people that Houston is a great place to come work in, in low carbon energy. Anyone else want to comment on that? That yeah, question? Yeah, this is, go ahead. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I would just, I agree with Marianne a hundred percent. There are some big players in the world that have taken a lead on uh, wind and solar development, ownership and construction. They tend to not be concentrated in any particular city. And then Houston, like as Marianne said, we've got the headquarters of many, many, many multi-billion dollar energy companies that are pivoting to green energy 
and no other city in the world has that. And secondly, a lot of the big renewable players like uh, Equinor, EDF, um, EDP, uh, Enil, uh, have put their U.S. offices here in Houston. So we, we've we've drawn in some of the global players for their U.S. presence here, and we've got big oil that's pivoting, you know, as we speak, and has a lot, you know, big big balance sheets, and they're pivoting toward uh, energy transition right now. So I. I think I agree with Marianne, we've got a branding problem and a little bit of a perception problem. And, but in terms of the core wind and solar, I think we have a great shot of being the headquarters of that. Maybe a tougher shot on being the headquarters of all the ancillary things like thermostats and technology. Uh, maybe Austin and San Francisco, you know, do a better job there. But on the core wind and solar, I think we have a good shot at that, of being the, the headquarters of that. And BJ, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, um, totally agree with Marianne and uh, what Jack said, right? I, I wish it was Austin and not Houston, right? But uh, Houston definitely has a head start and a lot of advantages, uh, the same ones that both of them mentioned, right? Uh, the, the financial institutions that support this big oil, this big business are already there, right? Um, the big oil and gas companies have the capital. It's just a matter of time when they make the decision to divert those resources to the, the new energy, right? So uh, those are some huge advantages. Um, thinking about deregulated market, right? We here in Austin, we are in this little noise zone where uh, we're not, uh, we're still regulated, but um, Houston's deregulated. You see a lot more activity in the deregulated space, The the, uh, energy provider space there as well. So lots of things going for Houston there. Gina, I'd like to jump in on this. I think this is really a question more of perception than reality. I think when you think about it, you know, we have the world's or the, we have the U.S.'s largest energy market, largest industrial energy complex, uh, largest electricity market, uh, uh, most progressive uh, electricity market. Um, we have port facilities. We have the world's largest collection of refineries and chemical plants. Um, and in addition to that, we also have a lot of skills that are resident in the, I'll call it traditional energy uh, spaces that can be applied. One of the reasons I believe why the renewable energy companies have located them in Houston or made Houston their U.S. headquarters is because a lot of the skills are complementary. If you're talking about business development, you're talking about capital project design and construction, you're talking about commodity marketing, you're talking about risk management. I mean, these are all things, the skills are, are translatable from uh, the traditional power sector, from the natural gas uh, uh, sector. And I think, you know, that's sometimes not really understood. You know, we have the markets, we have the infrastructure to pilot and test a lot of these things. And we have a lot of the skill base that's gonna be needed to do that, even if it hasn't necessarily been deployed yet in some of the renewable areas. Okay, um, any, Dr. Becca, do you have any thought, anything? If not, I'm happy to move on to another question. Um, it's well covered. So. Okay. So I have uh, questions about um, other forms of low carbon or zero emission energy and other than wind and solar that we've been talking about. And so um, thinking about what other types of low energy, low carbon energy forms can we start um, looking at and should be included, especially baseload options, maybe like nuclear and hydropower in this whole decarbonization future. Um, I know it's not necessarily an area we think about hydropower in Houston, but there is a lot of water and a lot of reservoirs and a lot of places we could probably power. Um, any thoughts about other forms um, and, and the progress we might be making in including those in the decarbonization future? I can, I can take a quick start. EDF being a, a big nuclear operator, uh, largest nuclear operator of power stations in the world, um, clearly in Europe, 
uh, we're balancing France using nuclear assets. Here in the United States, we don't have um, the robust nuclear infrastructure, but we can uh, continue to extend the life of those nuclear assets that we do have. So if you look at what's happening up in New York's power markets, for example, you know, they've got pretty aggressive carbon targets. Um, and part of that was looking at how they could extend uh, some of the, the nuclear power systems lives. Um, I do think, and, and I know it was it was out of scope for the students project today, but I, I do think part of the solution is, is part of the solution is on the demand side. Um, as an industry, we've been pretty shy to push price out to consumers and educate them on that the price of energy is not the same all day long. It changes throughout the course of a day and their peak prices um, and, and times in Texas when it's really hot, the peak of the day, power prices are more expensive. Uh, you know, the, the retail power contract I'm on, the power price changes every 15 minutes and I've got an app set up. So if prices go over $100 a megawatt, the pool shuts off and the air conditioning raises uh, four degrees on the set points and, you know, the thermostat glows blue so that the kids know to unplug some stuff to make mom happy. Um, and, and that all happens without me having to do anything. So it's, it's, it's not impacting my comfort. Um, you, you can override it. I, I think a big part of carbon reduction in the, in the U.S. really has to come to how we consume the energy ourselves and putting in place some mechanisms that help educate consumers that running the dishwasher and the washing machine at five o'clock at night in July is, is not helping our, our situation if you push it a couple hours one way or the other. Um, the, the other is just being mindful of, we, we are blessed with very low energy prices and, and the students touched on that in their presentations. We've got um, low energy prices compared to the rest of the country. But I think part of the problem is well, then we just use more. Early in my career, I saw a study from a utility uh, here in, in Texas that showed they could give away a free refrigerator to all their customers and it would have a one year payback. Because if you get a new refrigerator in Texas, people take your old refrigerator and put it out in the garage. Worst place to have refrigeration in Texas in the summer is in, is in your garage. So I do think it needs to be not just um, a, a source issue or a generation issue, but really a consumption um, and using some of this great technology to help us um, not have to build another gas plant. Yeah, I just want to jump in and add, add on a little there because I completely agree. Um, I think we don't even know or understand the degree to which we can um, change our load shapes because we have never, or just so much of the market is untapped in terms of giving them the pricing signals to see. Uh, when it comes to thinking about energy storage, which is you know, a lot of what we're talking about in order to make supply and demand match, you know, again, if you change demand in many, many cases, there's no cost to that. Um, if you're changing when people are doing certain things when they're you know, charging their EV for folks who have them or when they're, you know, when they're using loads, there's, there's actually no cost there. There's a lot of cost to uh, installing a battery or other form of energy storage. And so from an affordability standpoint, uh, you know, I think there could be, I envision a tremendous impact on, on cost when we uh, send the right price signals. Um, but, but to date folks who are looking and thinking about this, um, our researchers, they don't even know how to model the potential because we have done so little to look at um, how much load really could shift, how much people would be willing to shift if given the right pricing signals. Yeah, BJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to jump in there. Totally agree with uh, with the future load shapes uh, comment that uh, Dr. Becca made, right? I think the load will be much flatter in the future. Um, just with EVs, right? Again, obviously we need policy changes to make that happen uh, for building to grid and vehicle to grid, those kinds of things. But these are all potential loads and generators, right? On wheels. And if we are able to use that flexibility, we won't need to build new nuclear. We won't uh, hopefully have to build new gas generation as well. We will be able to uh, manage the variability of uh, wind and solar. I mean, we came a long way already. When I joined ERCOT in 2006, we had 2000 megawatts of wind. 
and th that was the end of the world. Um, people just <laughs> hated it, right? It's it, it, and uh, there's a lot of truth to it. It was very variable. We did not have the tools to manage the wind. Uh, if you told somebody that in 10 years it would be at 16,000 megawatts and 15 years it, it is at 30,000 megawatts right now, no, would, uh, no one in the control room would have believed you. But here we are, we went through uh, the, not this summer, but the previous summer, we went into uh, summer with a 7% margin and we went through it without a blip, right? Uh, so, uh, all this, even without the, the load flexibility that we're talking about here. So you throw that in, you new storage and be, better uh, controlling capabilities. I think uh, that, that is the right mix for future. I wanna yeah. follow up with that. Can I, can I ask you something? What about microgrids and distributed generation? So let's add another couple layers on. It, that is another area that's going to be um, such a big, uh, well, challenge as well as an opportunity, right? Uh, we talked about transmission. Uh, obviously, most of uh, the generation, the, the solar and wind resources are far away from load centers. Uh, that's where the DERs will come into the picture. Microgrids, I think they have very specific usages and might or might not be as prevalent as DERs, right? Cali if you look at California, they have a lot more DER penetration than uh, we have here in Texas, mostly because California tends to pay 15 cents, 20 cents per kilowatt hour, and we don't have to do that, right? But as the prices come down, we will definitely see that kind of penetration here in Texas as well. And, and uh, I work with utilities on a daily basis. I, uh, one of the things that you mentioned in the introduction, right? Working with utilities on smart grid deployment, big part of it is how do we manage these DERs? Can we aggregate them? Can we orchestrate them, right? Those are the things that need to be, uh, decisions that need to be made and the infrastructure that need to put in, right? Um, I saw a question about uh, data analytics. There's so much data out there. We are deploying AMI technologies. Right, uh, and uh, AI and ML were not a thing five years ago, at least in the energy industry, right? But those are real things that people are using. Uh, I'm working on a project where a company is trying to create a digital twin of every single asset that they have and be able to figure out the uh, optimal way to operate those, uh, those assets, right? That's where all this data will come in, all the technology will come in. And same thing with, can we predict who in the future is going to adopt the DERs? Can we position our grid? Can we upgrade the, the radial feeders to make sure we are able to, to serve those new uh, loads as well as DERs? So all that is happening now, not in the future. Jack, any final thoughts on that topic? No, but I do wanna go back to Marianne's comment about the man side. Um, are you saying to take away beer fridges, Marianne? Because I don't. <laughs> never, never. Just insulate them better. <laughs> okay. My enthusiasm for decarbonization started to go down a little bit. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, okay, let's see. I have I have a lot of questions about um, storage and the ideal storage solutions. So I'm going to try to combine them together and think about what is the ideal storage solution for decarbonization? Um, is, there, is there an ideal solution? Is it a mix? The, I, I have some comments about the hydrogen storage um, efficiency and geothermal technologies and forced air, right? Um, so let's, let's start that off. Um, actually, Jack, do you wanna, you wanna start there? I'd love to. I, yeah, I, I don't think there is an ideal solution. I think it varies by market. Um, you know, for instance, in the Pacific Northwest, they already have a tremendous uh, amount of hydro resource, which can provide uh, storage to the system there. So that's an obvious answer. Um, you know, it depends on the, the existing mix of assets in a particular market, how you know, is it nuclear coal heavy with a lot of less flexibility versus, you know, more flexibility 
what kind of renewable resources are most predominant in that market, solar, wind, or a mix. And then even when you take into effect, uh, into account all the supply and demand factors um, and the natural resources that, that occur in that particular market, you still have different segments of where you want storage. So there, there is a segment where I want, you know, short duration storage for grid balancing, you know, five minute to five minute, one minute to one minute grid balancing. Then I might want a longer solution for across the day type balancing multi-day. And then I might want, you know, a hydrogen type of a solution ultimately for, you know, multi-day, multi-week, multi-month, maybe even. So, I, no, I don't think there's a one size fits all. And I'm glad that I think the U.S. is doing a good job in the world, you know, is doing a good job of pursuing lots of different technologies, you know, shorter duration batteries, flow batteries with longer duration, pumped hydro, Ks, hydrogen, you know, I, I, I think the more we pursue uh, multiple avenues forward, the better off we'll be as we get, you know, a decade down the road. Professor B. Um, I, I don't have anything Jump to add. in with this. I, I okay. completely, uh, uh, completely agree with Jack. Awesome. Anyone else? I'll, I'll agree with Jack. I don't think there's a one size fits all solution when we look at um, the regional um, challenges of, of storage and, and in Texas with salt domes and in, in the West, we've got a lot of geothermal. Um, uh, here at EDF, we dispatch uh, power assets um, for, for other third parties, banks and hedge funds and independents. And, you know, from what works up in the Northeast really well with pumped hydro, um, you know, we, we've worked with Tesla dispatching their batteries into California markets and then, um, you know, flywheels. I, I, I do think it needs to be a regional approach that looks at the topography of the grid, the particular challenge that you're trying to solve, and then look for the solution that best fits um, that that local issue. So, so I agree. It's 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 not a one size fits all answer. Dr. Jones, Albertus, do you, do you want to have any comments on this? Um, I, yeah, I think Marianne and Jack have covered it really well. I completely agree. It's not, it's not one size fits all. Um, and the other thing, there's a lot of interesting technologies that people are looking at across a broad diversity. So we have what, what is ready today and we have, you know, what's getting developed. I will say that, um, uh, you know, there, there are longer duration energy storage technologies that are very well established, like pumped hydro, um, and, uh, and, and to some extent, you know, you know K's and some, some others, when you get to um, energy storage, just to add into the layers, it's not just about, um, so there's the technology, there's the regional variation as well, but there's also the financeability, um, which is, I think, a challenge in this space, just to throw in as well, given that we're seeing, I think, less and less appetite for large capital projects. And so when some of our options for energy storage the regional level are um, are larger capital projects. Uh, they 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 have different challenges in pursuing those compared to batteries and um, which and other storage options which are more modular. I'd like to uh, Gina. I'd like to go back to a comment that Becca made earlier about affordability and reliability when it comes to storage because uh, one phenomenon that we've observed is. Um, Initially, when the integration of renewables is kind of a 5% of the time kind of event, you know, one in 20 hours, it's a problem. It's hard, it, it, it's easier or, or say more economically efficient to waste that resource for 5% of the time. It, it takes high renewable penetration where you might be curtailing or wasting that wind and solar resource 15 to 20% of the hours before the incremental cost of energy storage starts to make a lot more sense. So I think that's a point Becca was making earlier about affordability, but you, you certainly in the initial stages, you know, wasting some solar and wind through curtailment is not that costly. It only becomes costly later at, at very high levels of penetration. 
Okay. So I have a really great question for everyone and it might be the last one. We'll see how we do here. But to what degree, someone wants to know, is low carbon energy generation responsible for the recent troubles in the reliability of California's electric grid? Um, obviously fires also play a role, but are there lessons Texas can learn for decarbonizing without those issues? Who would like to go first? That's a spicy meatball. Um, so uh, when you when we think about California and we're still dissecting exactly what happened with the with the recent um, outages and clearly um, the particulates in the air from the fires caused the solar generation to be greatly um, impacted during that time. I do think um, one of the things that so moving away from California, but to what Texas has done well. Is, is have a, a, a pretty broad view about, it's okay to have it in our backyard. Um, we have built assets in the state of Texas. We make it easy for assets to interconnect to our transmission grids. Um, we are not trying to push the problem out to our neighboring states. So we really have owned, and part of it is the nature of our grid, we're an island. Um, so we have to, uh, but I, I think one of the, the things that does make us a, a bit different, and one of the reasons I, I really love ERCOT as much as I do, um, is that it's a, it's a pretty holistic view and saying, okay, we've got to take care of the entire grid. How do we make sure that when the wind stops blowing and the sun's not shining, that the lights stay on? And, and how can we not only send price signals and get our industrials to work with us to do that, and we've got a lot of programs in Texas that incentivize those big industrial consumers to, to curtail their consumption when, when the grid needs them to. Um, so I, I do think that that's part of the approach in Texas that has helped us avoid and get to a place where 59% of the power in, the, in Texas was coming from wind this May, and, and you know, it's not an event. Um, so, so I, I do think it's, it's, it is going to be a challenge. It's going to be again, regional and how it's solved. Um, but it's about eyes wide open and understanding what the impact to our power grid is going to be as we continue to add these intermittent resources. Yeah, I agree with Marianne. I mean, you can't blame what happened in California on the technology. You blame it on the planners. Um, we, it's no secret that you're going to have variability in the output of solar and wind resources. So, you know, you plan for that. You, you know, you have backup based on statistical analysis of what you expect to have happen. And if your statistical analysis was too rosy, that shame on the planners, not, not the technology. Yeah, one thing I'll jump in and add is as we do reach, um, more and more of these events, like Mary mentioned, where, you know, in NORCOT, there was a short period of time where wind was supplying nearly 60% of the power. And we've seen that in the country where wind and solar have been 60, 70% for moments in time. Um, as those moments become longer and those numbers become higher, we do need to change how we um, use wind and solar and what we expect of them on the grid. Right now, we don't expect them to uh, support a lot of the grid stability needs and they're capable of doing it. The power electronics that they connect to um, can do all of these functions, but we are not using them to do that. And getting over that um, engineering hurdle of really figuring out how to do that and keep the grid stable is, um, is a direction we need to go. Um, we're supporting a lot of research that's looking at this, again, the proof of concept is there. These resources can do this, but they don't do it by inertial rotation. They do it by really fast digital power electronics. So they're gonna do it differently. We have to make sure that when there's a whole bunch of them that are working in sync, that they don't rapidly spin out of whack. Um, it's it's a imminently, I have all imminently solvable problem. It's an engineering problem. I have full confidence we can solve it, but we need to start using um, these generators and get some experience and continue to do the, the demonstrations and validations so that as we have these longer periods of time that we're relying on these power electronics based generators, um, that, that they're able to keep the grid stable so that we don't have issues. Yeah, I'll just underline Becca's point, you know, as ERCOT's gone from 10% renewables to 24% today of, of supply, our reliability uh, frequency 
uh, management reliability scores called CPS one scores have done nothing but go up. They've gotten better. Uh, and in fact, today, like Beck, I don't know if you're aware in ERCA, I mean, all the wind resources provide primary frequency down service to the grid in a big way. I mean, they're a big part of the, the uh, primary frequency response in Texas right now. So no, I think you can manage it. Uh, it takes good planning. Uh, and you can't go in with rose colored glasses about, you know, backing up backing up the power when you need it. Okay, well, we have two minutes, one minute left. Um, and so I would love to hear any closing thoughts that anyone might have for today's panel. Anything we didn't cover that you would like to mention or um, if not, I will turn it over can I make Ramanan? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to make one last comment about the, the the solar issues in California, which is interesting for Texas because in California the planning function is basically the regulators. Uh, they determine what the utilities procure and how much they should procure. And in Texas, it's people like Marianne. Marianne, uh, it's the people who serve load on a commercial basis, are making the decisions about how to back up their renewables how to have reliability with affordability. So it'll be really interesting to see, I mean, so far, knock on wood, we've, you know, Texas has done a great job managing reliability and affordability, but uh, you know, over the next five and 10 years, we'll see how people like Marianne <laughs> manage the system with their commercial decisions. No pressure there. <laughs> no pressure. And I, I would just in closing, um, really want to encourage U of H students, um, if you haven't considered a career in energy, um, to really look at what we're doing, what companies in Houston are doing to help through this energy transformation. Um, it is going to be, the next 10 years are going to be um, pivotal in our, in our uh, movement toward green, renewable, low carbon energy. Um, it's going to be a great time to get in um, and establish and, and, and really have a, a pretty um, diverse career in, in what you can do around energy. It's not, it's not just uh, oil and gas anymore. There's, there's a um, whole lot of, and in and, and the industry, we need, we need thinkers, data scientists, people who can take data and turn it into information that we can use to make better decisions. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's really a, a great field. You know, one last co comment, if I can follow up on that, right? Um, it's amazing that uh, probably it's the first uh, um, call in a long time there. We haven't talked about the pandemic, <laughs> even though we are right in the middle of a global pandemic and that uh, <laughs> kudos to everybody for, for us as humans for our resilience, right? But coming out of this, I think there's going to be billions or trillions of dollars that are going to be injected into the economy and much of it will go into our industry, right? For students and everybody here on this call, it's a great opportunity and it, but it's also a, resp a great responsibility on how we use that and build a better future. So I, I'm very excited about what's, uh, what's going to come here in the near future. Yeah, and I just wanna add, um, you know, we've talked uh, a good bit about technology and markets today, but but broadly speaking, you know, you can get involved in the energy sector with all kinds of backgrounds. And there's all kinds of needs. So wherever your skill sets lie, um, you know, if, if your energy, if your interest is peaked and you're you're thinking about careers, there's ways to apply them. Um, from finance to communications, you know, of course, engineering and science. There's there's a there's a diverse set of needs um, that we have in the energy sector, and so. Um, diverse set of backgrounds. Well, thank, thank you, you to so everyone. Much. Yeah, yeah. Ramanan, do you wanna close us out? Sure, thanks so much, Gina, that was terrific. I thought the, the panel did a great job, appreciated everybody get, coming on and, yes, and really engaging in a um, really uh, high level conversation that got into the details and really gave our students and, and faculty and staff here an opportunity to hear a lot more about what the grid's going to do. Uh, Gina, thanks for uh, moderating this discussion. I want to thank Marianne for taking the time. Uh, Dr. Becca Jones, Jack, Vijay, and Greg, uh, thanks so much for joining uh, on the panel. Um, 
special thanks to the students uh, who did the project this summer. What a terrific job. And, you know, there've been so many requests for your slides. Uh, we've, we've actually posted them on our website now. Um, a, a terrific job. And I hope that uh, this starts uh, your future career in the energy world. Um, with that, I want to thank uh, our partners at Center for Houston's Future, as well as Gemi, um, the volunteers from the Energy Coalition, as well as the uh, staff from UH Energy for putting this together. With that, thank you all, and we'll see you back here next Friday uh, for the hydrogen story and how Houston can lead that, uh, that transformation. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you all. Bye-bye.